As much as I love Warhammer, I think it's time I start looking at other war games at the moment. I'm just sick of GW's bullshit as of late. So you know what? Let's take a look at this game. Hello people, I'm D Scorpion, and we're taking a look at Darklands. Now, funny enough, a lot of people have already kind of reviewed Darklands, at least the miniature side, but no one has ever talked about the game, which is what I want to talk about. Let's start with a little backstory, though. Darklands was originally kickstarted in 2013 by creator Rob Lane and his company, Mersha Miniatures. Yes, Mersha. Not Mears, Mersha, even though no one says it that way. <laughs> According to a Facebook post by Mersha, it also talks about how Rob kind of created this world since he was 10 and finally wanted to share it with the world. Which is pretty cool, following your dreams as a kid, but here's where it kind of gets a little weird. A forum on BoardGameGeek basically said that despite the Kickstarter finishing, the actual rules for Darkland weren't out yet, and it wouldn't be until 2016 until people got the rulebook. On top of that, it was mainly written by Rob himself, which is somewhat impressive, but even more when I found out a very recent post from that board stated that his team is only around five people. It also does state that Mersha doesn't do well in advertising as Rob isn't a social media guy and he, quote, doesn't bribe content creators. But I'm not being bribed at all. I'm doing this out of genuine curiosity and interest. So Rob, uh, consider this free advertising, but don't expect everything to be positive. Now, the models themselves are amazing. They have insane detail to them and really look nice when you put them on the board. I do have some issues though. Number one, um, they are either resin or metal. Metal is meh, I just need to do pinning and whatnot, so I'm not concerned, but resin is torture. This one particular Roman model was a pain in the ass because one, his little like staff thing on his back, like the ball and joint socket didn't really quite work. So I had to just glue the staff fully to his back. His little ankles here actually broke off and I just had to like very carefully super glue it together. You can actually see it better here on this sprue model, mind you. And it, you know, it really does suck because I don't like working with resin. There is somewhat of a size difference with the models as of late because apparently Mersha is like doing some resizing, at least according to this blog post. I even did a quick size comparison of two models I had previously bought. And yeah, there is definitely a size difference. Another note is that the models actually, dare I say, make Games Workshop look very affordable. <laughs> I never thought I'd be saying that. One thing is to note that they actually have pretty frequent sales and a special bundle deal. The one final note on the models themselves is some of them can be a bit sexualized, especially the female ones, as you can clearly see with, uh, well, balloon tits here. But as someone who's kind of grown up with this kind of style for a number of years, I personally don't really give a shit. So take it for what you will. All right, but let's get into the brief setting of the game. Darklands takes place in Northwest Europe in the year 650 AD with basically real life monsters and mythologies roaming around. All with the exception of elves and dwarves. I don't know why, but Rob really does not want them. I also briefly want to go over all the various different factions in the game, just to give you an idea of like what you're kind of dealing with. The Albine. Known as the Picti by the Romans and as Scotland today, they really focus on hordes of infantry, anti-magic rocks, and ogres. Some. The Engelson, the people from southern Denmark that would eventually give England its name and are currently the poster child of the game. They're also massive furries. Brythoniad, the original Brits, pushed to the mountains by the Engelson and would later become whales. They make packs with dragons and dragon men, though their magic side is apparently limited, if not existent at all. Why? They're Christian. God, is it okay if we make packs with dragons? Yes, yes my child, child, it is okay. Dragons are a-okay. -okay. What about magic? You're going, You're going to hell! Speaking of, the Byzanti, the Eastern Roman Empire during this age seeking to reclaim their old empire by making a pact with basically the devil and demons. Demons can also be fielded as their own separate army. The Aaron, or better yet, the Irish. In this setting, their luck actually might turn around since they got a nice reference to Kukulain and have Groot's killer offspring to join them. The Jutes, basically the Engelson, but from northern Denmark and focus on bugs and spiders. So, crawlies? As well, they have an undead vibe to them, making them the edgy necromancers of England. Finally, the Norse. They're Vikings, with trolls, bird people, giants, a monster named after a really disgusting fetish. You take your pick. Now, those are actually more the real-world factions of the game, but there are more, and these are more based on the mythologies and whatever Rob could make up. Atalantis. It's Atlantis, but spelled differently. A very Greek-themed army that focuses on golems and colossi. For Morians, not to be confused with the ones from D&D, this faction is pulled from Irish mythology, of sea devils rising from the depths and claiming the world. 
and they're basically Warriors of Chaos. Chthonies. Basically, if you thought the Brithoniad were scalies, well, you now have a full faction. You got Gorgons and Snakes, Salamanders, Crocodiles, Basilisks, Hydras, and a turtle. You can essentially go very specialized into one or kind of have a sample platter. Finally, the Eisens. The best way to describe them is basically druids combined with a Drukhari and horrible, horrible flesh abominations. Now, I actually wanted to discuss them a bit because originally I thought they were supposed to be the French due to their location on the map. But I also noticed that a lot of them are called Drunes, and I decided to look into it. From what I found, there is some real world history on them, like how they serve the horn god Kernanos, a Celtic god of nature, but outside of that, they themselves have no reference in history, at least from what I can look up. The only other place I'm able to find anything of, like, say, Drunes was from Cal de Waldron's Confrontation, or from Slain, a comic series published by 2000 AD. That's kind of similar to Conan the Barbarian, but based more on Celtic myths. If you haven't guessed already, this game is basically fictional history, which is fine, but it has problems. For starters, it doesn't fully explain all the characters in there, like the King Penda, a real-world leader of the Kingdom of Mercia, who has a werewolf hand. Why does he have a werewolf hand? I, I also just want to point out real quick that this particular model came with dirt. I don't know why, it just it came with dirt. <laughs> At the same time, if you're not really familiar with the history of England, especially during the Dark Ages, or even familiar with the geography, you might get a little confused on what's fictional and what's real. For example, I actually thought Northumberland was fake until I looked it up and it's real, unlike Ohio. All right, now let's actually get to the main rule book. Chapter one is basically the introduction, letting you know what to expect. Chapter two tells you about some of the basics of army building, the states of units, and how to read unit sheets. Chapter 3 goes over all, like, the battlefield rules, such as positioning, weather, movement, etc. Chapter 4 goes over the basics of the actual game, such as initiative, activating units, and endgame. Chapter 5 goes over actions, things your units can perform, and orders, which are essentially stances that determine what actions those units can do. Chapter 6 then lists and details all 54 actions, followed by Chapter 7, which goes into detail on reactions, as well as listing and describing them. Which, why couldn't chapter 5 and 6 do this combined? I don't know. Now, with that, I want to briefly just talk about the book as a whole. Formatting-wise, it's not the best. Trying to tell subsections apart are really hard because of how they have this numbering system of like, oh, it's three numbers here, but four numbers here. The size isn't really that different. There's no, like, color differentiation, so it's kind of hard to tell. Images are fine. Like, okay, it's cool concept art, I'm not going to lie. But it also heavily warps around the pages a bit too much at times. And on a brief last note, the index is... There basically is no index. It's just nothing about the index works. Panic is on 192? Nope, that's a retreat action with no mention of panic. Terrain is on 76? Nope, it's one page off. This particular engage for some reason, 190? Attack move. The book itself aside, let's kind of then just go over the actual game. First off, the game uses D10s rather than D6s. It's like most of the war games. There is no pre-measuring except for two certain cases, which is a little weird. But then there is player acuity, which based on how many games of Darklands you play, that determines what kind of rules you should be using, which to me is stupid. Rules should not be limited based on how many games you actually play. And for the most part, some rules that are considered complex are when I actually can read them, aren't really that complex. Like, say, Burrow and Emerge. It's just kind of like Deep Strike in Warhammer. Now, more issues, however, start around Chapter 2, with two big ones. Number one is the copy and paste formulas. And this is almost throughout the book in many, many cases. It is boring and repetitive. States themselves just are very, very bad, where it's like you have to read through fluff text, you have to read, like, what the state does, like, what bonuses or negative it does, how to, like, get out of it. Which, okay, fair enough. It's, you kind of need to explain this stuff, but it does it in this same old formula that just takes time and space. I think a better example of how bad this is is with equipment, because you have this little section on where it explains hands, but it has to repeat the exact same paragraph for hands in, say, your shot weapons and invoke equipment. The second issue comes with scan codes, which... It's actually kind of a neat little feature. You take your phone with a scan app, you scan it, and you get a nice little tutorial to explain the rules. Okay, that's actually kind of cool and innovative. Except only one scan code works for Bloodlust. Every other scan code, as far as I can tell, leads you to this exact same video on one of Mercia's YouTube pages, 
which only has been recently active just for figure showcases. They didn't even finish this idea entirely. And this is kind of the thing you notice throughout the book. It just has issues. For example, even though chapter two I mentioned kind of goes over the basics of army building, there are no actual rules for army building in the book. Those, however, are in the download section with like all the army rosters, which is nice, but let me tell you, army building is a fucking nightmare. In addition to gold, you can only take units in what are basically I can call commands with your general and your sub commanders leading your units. Through this, you have to keep track of authority, which is basically a limit on how many units you can bring under your general or subsequent commanders. It's essentially a hero tax that applies to, if you want to say, bring a giant dragon that probably would be able to act independently without needing orders. But in addition to that, you also need a number of mainstay, the equivalent of battle line for each command you bring, and they need to be of a certain size, which eats your gold. Some units can be turned into mainstay with a certain rule, but there's another rule that does the same thing with like another unit, except it's not mainstay and you need to bring two of them to then turn into mainstay. It's just, it's so much to keep track of. It also doesn't help that when you do kind of look at the unit sheets, it looks like it was made in Microsoft Excel. And the only way to reference these units is with a small detailed description at the bottom, rather than say, oh, I don't know, the concept art you love to use throughout the book. Even in the book, it shows you using concept art next to the profile. Why don't you use that here? But getting back to the main book, there are plenty more issues. An entire section from chapter 2 is just repeated in chapter 3. All 54 actions are listed just in this giant block of action, order, and how you like determine it. And it's just, it's very confusing because not every unit can use all these actions. In addition, chapter 6 doesn't necessarily do that good of a job of explaining all the different actions in a very proper, clean way. For example, the two most basic actions you may be taking are the attack and shoot action that take up 15 to 17 pages to explain. These are some of the most common actions you perform in any war game. Why do you need this many pages to explain it? Even pages that are just one page, one fucking page, could even just be shortened to like half a page so you could fit more in there. But honestly, something that really pisses me off is how engage is an action. Engage is an action. Like, okay, coming from Warhammer, it, there's like a whole different set of rules that I don't really want to explain right now. But engage as an actual action, 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 it just, it feels wrong. <laughs> and it should feel more like a battlefield rule, like with sight, which by the way, there are sight arcs, hence why there are little marks on the base. But in addition, with how detailed the book is in describing things, it somehow then wraps back around to not describing other details. For example, with engage, there's something called swift engage. It doesn't specify charge distance the first time I read it. So initially, if you look at this example, I could only move this unit up six inches, but if you're the first time reading it, you could just dash zero to 100 all the way across the board to this unit. It wasn't until I found it on the forms, not an FAQ on the download section that they don't have but the forms was it like oh here's the faq to that no or how about just the rules sometimes forget themselves for example the rampage rule is this unit can only perform this action if it's frenzied but it, then the next paragraph over it says this unit either stays or enters the frenzied state enters as in it wasn't frenzied before so what and chapter six continues just to be a pain in the ass with its descriptions. Now I can understand that you need to like explain certain actions, but again, it's the repetitiveness of this book that really gets me. For example, every time you have to read an action, it has to explain a unit performing X is called X and every warrior within is so-and-so. Examples, a unit performing a run action is also called a running unit and every warrior within it is also called a running warrior or runner until the run action is resolved. A unit performing a fly action is also called a flying unit, and every warrior within it is called a flying warrior or flyer until the fly action is resolved. Yes. A unit performing a land action is also called a landing unit, and every warrior within it is called a landing warrior or lander until the land action is resolved. Yes, I see. A unit performing a charge action is also called a charging unit, and every warrior within it is called a charging warrior or charger until the charge action is resolved. Be quiet. A unit performing an ambush action is also called an ambushing unit, and every warrior within it is called an ambushing warrior or ambusher until the ambush action is resolved. Be quiet! A unit performing a, 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 a
Now, granted, I haven't played any actual matches of Darklands, which, yeah, sure, you can say, oh, but how can you judge a game without playing it? Guys, you have to realize after everything I've gone through, this is not an easy game to understand. And this is coming from the fact that war games in general are pretty complex games. I mean, also counting the fact I'm the only one in my current community kind of learning this, and it's also expensive to like ship all this stuff overseas, but it's not easy to learn this shit. And with that, can I really recommend this? I don't fucking know. The game does honestly seem fun. Like, I like the setting. I do love the models, but holy shit, the rules kill it for me. However, the rules overall just need a huge polishing, which kind of brings me to my next point and also why I'm kind of rushing this video is that second edition is coming out this November. <laughs> You know, if you don't want to play the game, that's fine. I still would actually say check out Mersha just for the models. You can use them as just stuff for Dungeons and Dragons, uh, proxies for other war games, or just the paint in general for fun. I do want to kind of give just some feedback as to like what I would like to see in second edition or even uh, the potential third edition of the game if I don't see them here. First, sort your actions better and or limit them. 54 is a lot to go through and with how only certain monster units can perform certain actions, it would be smarter to sort them like this. Also, change engage to a battlefield rule. It, there's no reason it needs to be an action. Rework a lot of stuff. There are too many states to keep track of. You can limit them. Fled, I don't even know why, is like a state. That's just what happens. Privilege and class, honestly, just need to be combined and actually have better rules and whatnot because uh, they're just otherwise glorified descriptions. You could also break some rules down to core versus optional and also have more of a common, uncommon, and rare system. Core rules would just be like, here's how Battlefield works, positioning. Well, optional rules, such as, say, Sight arcs, weather, and even time could all just be interchangeable if you want to add just that little extra crunch to it. And the rarity system would kind of be based on rules of like, okay, you're playing smaller games, so you're going to be seeing more common rules. If you're playing larger games, that includes larger monsters, and thus you see more rarer rules. Clean up the numbers on charts and unit sheets. I, I don't understand, like, if these numbers don't go out of their respective ranges, just round them to just single digits. And also just make unit sheets cleaner, but also add more difference. Like these two units from the Aaron sheet are basically identical except for these factors. And on top of that, limit your detailing. I cannot stand reading the exact same formula over and over again. Keep it simple and precise. And that's ultimately how I feel a lot of games should kind of be nowadays. Anyways, that's my thoughts. I may do a second review on the second edition when it comes out. And yeah, if you like this video, uh, leave a comment, share and like, and I'll uh, see you in the next one.